So I'd say, especially if you're an artist on the good music, but not a lot of traction side yet, you know, just be ready for the fact that a lot of these meetings are just going to be like, people are going to rush you and you're going to feel rushed. And there's some truth in that, right? Like you do want to take advantage of that. Like if you're talking about like a really one, like life changing type of viral moment, you got people who are throwing you way too much money. And sometimes it's good to just take it because it's not smart. They're not thinking like business wise. They're thinking like competition wise. Mm. So you need to take advantage of that. What's up? What's up? What's up? It's brand man, Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with a another episode of no labels necessary podcast you can catch us every tuesday every thursday on apple youtube spotify wherever you check your podcast out here at the intersection of currency and creative we're figuring this thing out and we always are on the journey to find people who represent the no labels concept and we have one here with us today samson <laughs> <laughs> Bro, you just fucking bodied that intro. Holy oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> shit. I appreciate that, man. Oh, but no, gross. we got a really dope person here today. He is a label owner, a manager, has worked with multiple different artists and just all around one of the coolest people in the industry. Y'all are going to get a lot of gain from this in interview with Sam. So first and foremost, Sam, appreciate having you on the pod. Yeah, man. You know. Hang out with y'all way too much anyway, especially him. So Low key part, part two. <laughs> yeah, hey, well, you, you had this guy, Salty, the other day. I mean, technically it wasn't you, it was Tom, but that's a... Wait, about what? <laughs> the park situation, you're not making oh, yeah. it. Where did you go? Uh, no. You didn't go? It was in Monroe. Oh, All man. right. See, I'm not going Y'all say that weird, but I'm not going to get let this get distracted. The, we're going to hop right into it, man. Can you talk about the artist? Your, I'm going to call it your big three. Okay. Artist, right? The the starter artist. Now you get into a lot of different situations, becoming real industry and whatnot. But can you what? explain? <laughs> can you explain? <laughs> your, how you got into the game and the three, you know, main artists that you kind of like. They really kind of molded how you move in the industry. Yeah. So, um, I started out just knowing I wanted to work in music, but I had no conception at all of how to do that. Like to the point that. You know, I was like on LinkedIn trying to like email people who worked at Warner or even I was like trying to like send in applications off LinkedIn to like Warner Music Group and shit. Like I didn't realize that this is an industry that's its own ecosystem that you can't just send a online resume. And I wasn't like it wasn't that I wasn't working hard. It was just like the avenues that I had at the time to reach people. I got like one of those like. Uh, it was like a bullshit internship with some random dude who just like I saw on LinkedIn that he worked at like a, a nation, a, 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 a label. It was some like like Def Jam or Rock Nation or something. But he, he just put it there. He didn't actually work at the label. He just like mm -hmm. was a consultant, but he wasn't even really a consultant for the label. I think it was just some one of those cap situations. And like, um, you know, even that situation, like where I put in like time and effort and this dude was just nuts. Um <laughs> you know, what it was like something, you know, and then I finally got up here, um, got a, uh, unpaid internship at Patchwork Studios. So shout out to Oz, who is the studio manager there. Cause he like really put me on and also like heavily influenced how I structure my business and how I run like from a management perspective and stuff. So, um, Osman Bang yeah, Bangura um, at Patrick Studios was super, super, super influential, and I would say put me on um, more than anybody to like get started. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, right after that, I met you at actually, yeah, I met you. I met I met you right after I met Jacory um, at Patchwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you came in. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere because we had probably just met yes. around the time. Yeah, it was when he was. <laughs> you, I might have met you even maybe before y'all met. It's possible. Yeah, no, you definitely. I didn't met you definitely before I met. Yeah, you. yeah. I didn't even know that. Um, but yeah, and I, I met you. I met Grant, um, and Augusto, and um, and we did Blue Summer, uh, and then from doing Blue Summer. Like, I think we made a really good name for ourselves in the creative scene here in Atlanta and like basically just got a, a, a good reputation for doing above and beyond for the artists and taking people really seriously, which is really influential to how I do the business, too. It's like you got to take artists seriously. Like if you're sitting here and saying, oh, this kid is just a SoundCloud rapper, but you're not paying attention to like the lyrical cadences he's using or the the type of perspective he's coming from and like the way that he's experimenting with sounds, then you're tripping, you know. 
Um, and I think that that was one of the things that we really did was we really believed in the creative scene. Mm-hmm. Like we really believed in ourselves. We believed in the creative scene. We believed that we could t- be a vehicle to bring that creative scene to like a much wider audience. Um, and that's how I met the uh, first artist I started managing, Taj. Um, and I uh, met him because he performed. He was the, like, we remember we, we would get so many DMs to the Blue Summer account. Um, and we would get like 100 DMs every show for people trying to like perform or whatever. Um, and Taj was like the one that I was like, oh, this is hard. Like he sent Gunder. I was like, dude, this is fucking sick. Like, yeah, <laughs> like come out. And then um, he pissed off the venue. But I th- actually, he pissed off Grant just throwing all the water bottles. <laughs> like, that shit was like. I was at that show. What, oh, yeah. was that, that was his first show? Yeah. It was, yeah. Like, yeah. Y'all? yeah. It was great. The fans Man. loved it. Yo, I, because you weren't managing Taj at the time, right? That was like, but like, I, I fucked before. with him just from that performance. Honestly. I was just like, yo, this dude is. So I, I didn't really remember his name and all that stuff, but I was just like, that was no. the one person. I was like, yo, this. He was performing like he was already that dude, and right. everybody he's, was there for him. He's been that dude. That's that's <laughs> why that's why a big part of why he's so great. But yeah. um, uh, yeah. And so I met Taj, and then I, Taj just put on Instagram like, yo, I need a manager. And I was just like, you know, like word, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, like what's good. <laughs> Um, and then we just started working together and that's been like a really, really, really like rewarding and, uh, just insanely complex journey, you know, of like bringing him to where he's at and continuing to work and knowing that we're like nowhere close to our goals. Like in some ways we're very close to our goals. Like have y'all seen the video of shake bringing out Taj at Coachella. Yeah. Yeah. So we have these crazy moments that are awesome that are happening, but then we're also dealing with a lot of, um, just real life shit. And that can get in the way of things. And then also um, the fact that like, you know, we've, we've been pushing so hard and we haven't been putting out like a whole lot of music. We've just been putting out extremely good music. And so it's kind of like, you know, we're trying to work on building out that audience, but that's, that's been awesome. So I started managing Taj um, and then I started managing Six Dogs in 2019, like right after he left his deal with Interscope. Um, I started managing him a couple months after that. And that was pretty crazy. Like essentially being a totally green manager, you know, just like believing like blue summer experience, just patchwork experience, just believing in myself and the people I was around, but um, just started working with Chase. Like, and once again, it was cause I took him so seriously, you know, cause I really like, he's a genius. Like I knew that and I took him really, really, really seriously. And so, um, I was really working on helping him build out his visions and like guide those visions in a way that was going to be, um, like organized and, and maximize the impact of those things. And so that was cool. And that really resonated with him. And then, um, I was at the time I was editing like AMV edits for his songs, you know, but the crazy thing was I said I would do it, but I didn't know how to edit. And so I spent like 30 hours on like two of these like two minute edit clips, but they came out pretty crazy. And I learned like, that's how I like literally, that's how I learned how to use Premiere Pro <laughs> <laughs> um, for the most part. Like I knew how to do like really basic shit, but, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then, but then he just, I don't think he fucked with the, them when they came out either. Um, like when, when I sent them to him, but he was just like, yo, this is so sick. You've worked so hard. You put in so much time. Like, and then I don't know, we just started getting closer. And then he, um, he hit me one day like, yo, can you help me get back into my YouTube channel? Cause I guess he'd like forgotten the password and it, it had been previously run by Interscope or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. some like, some like that. Um, like it wasn't his, like, I don't think he created the YouTube account. Probably not. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> yeah, for sure. I was like, bet. And I sent him a proposal of like, yo, this is what I think I can do for you. You know what I mean? As if I'm like officially your manager, because we'd already been hanging out a lot and doing a lot of stuff for like a few months. Um, and then he was like, yeah, for sure. And then he did one of the most amazing things. Cause he, 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 Oz put me on to get started. And then um, he put me on in a crazy way because he agreed, not even agreed. He just came out the gate and was like, cool. Like how much is, do you want as a manager? And I was like, well, because you're already established and I don't know what, like, I don't have that much experience. Um, I feel like 10% is fair. You know, and then out the gate, he just started paying me 10 percent on what he was already making off of like his existing streaming. Mm. And that was such a crazy thing because that allowed me to go um, like that combined with getting a bunch of the six hundred dollar unemployment stuff from pandemic shit. 
and then also still working at a restaurant whilst getting that $600 um, because I have my hours reduced. So it's still qualified like that put me ahead and then I was able to quit my job. Um, but mostly because Chase was like literally willing to just like put me on retainer basically on the, the belief that he had that I would be great, mm-hmm. you know? And he would always tell me like, yo, like I feel like your like your art is this management shit. Like you're so good at that. Um, and so he was always such a huge champion for me and that was like really important, um, and super helpful. And then, um, from there, you know, I guess I didn't realize the impact because I actually didn't know who Chase was like before, like I maybe had heard some of his stuff on SoundCloud or something, but I hadn't, like, I really wasn't that hip. Um, so when I first met him, I just, you know, I didn't know. And so it took me a, a while to like, um, really, I guess, realize how big of a deal it was that I was managing six dogs. Cause it still just feels like, Oh, it's just chase. Like it still never has felt like anything else. Even after I kind of realized like how deep his fan base went and everything and how much like depth there was to what he built. Um, but you know, it was kind of just like, Oh yeah, it's just chase, you know? So it was interesting to see that like then me doing that, I think put my name on some people's radar and stuff. And then of course, Tom, uh, who we'd been, who you'd brought out to our first, you brought out to Barely Human or whatever, almost nearly oh, more than human, more than human, <laughs> 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 almost human. <laughs> um, and then like two weeks later, he did Blue Summer mm. with us. And so I, I've I've known Sean since we've both we've known Sean since he had like three hundred monthly listeners on Spotify and just had a little bit of traction on SoundCloud. Um, and yeah, and then you know Sean kept working, um, getting his shit uh moving a little bit on social media and stuff and just getting pretty good youtube views and things and then some sort of dam broke i think he hit indify back when indify was still primarily like sending out anr sheets and stuff like that i think like um i never really understood all that as deeply because i'm not in the major label side but um and then yeah just like he got hit up by a bunch of different labels and then that became that journey of like going and, and getting thrown into like the industry um which was really, really, really beneficial. And I met a lot of really amazing people um, that I still am. I'm, I'm just still growing in this place. It's so much fun um, being here in like the real industry. Um, but I got thrown into it because then I'm meeting all these A&Rs and all these people that were reaching out about Sean. And then uh, Tyler Henry, um, who runs a company called Sturdy, he uh, literally put me, Chase, Sean and Taj up in his house in LA in the hills for two weeks. And I mean, of course, that was because, like, you know, I was like, well, yeah, like, if if we're going out there, like, the guys are coming. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and he was just, like, mad supportive of me and what I was doing as a manager at the time. He wasn't, like, necessarily trying to, like, sign Tom or anything like that. You know, and so I owe him a lot for just being, uh, uh, putting me on like that and putting all of us on like that. And then I just made sure to, like, really make friends with the people that were reaching out and not just, like, every... I mean, obviously, like, people fall off your radar because you get so fucking busy. You can't be talking to all the people that you've, like, had a good connection with and shit, but, like, all the time. Um, I try to tap in with people at least once every couple months, though. Like, uh, just for real. But, like... What's your system for that? I wouldn't say it's a system. It's just, like, I think my system is that I, I fuck with people who I make friends with. And so, like, if if I've, like, gotten to the point that I want to hit you up because I think you're doing some dope shit, um, it's because I like I fuck with you on like a, a level. So usually it's not really, it's just like, because that's the initial system of how like I basically dictate who I fuck with in, in the business side is like, do I like actually want to build creative stuff with you? Um, and, and do you like make me stoked to like talk to you and shit? Mm-hmm. Um, and because of that, it's not really like I need a system after that. Cause I'll just remember and be like, Oh fuck. Like, like I haven't hit Jeremy. Or you'll see them do something. And they're yeah, I'll just be like, Oh yeah. shit. Like bro, good shit. But like, yeah, it's about, Oh shit. I just haven't, I, I haven't, I haven't talked to Jeremy for a while. Or, oh, I forgot to hit Alex back about this uh, Zoom call we were supposed to do or whatever, whatever. And then I'm like, oh, shit, I, I'm a tech. Because you, I want to talk to him. You know what I mean? And then it just so happens that because we're playing the same game, like by the, we're playing the same sport, basically, and there's not that many people who are, like, really good at this sport. Um, we're all, like, kind of almost like the, there's, like, this group of us that are all the whole – like industry is, is, is as it is like the real at the top level industry it's this big sport that we're all playing and so you're always like super stoked to talk to someone else who's playing the same sport because i can't talk to most people 
about like, bro, did you see like thanks so much as marketing campaign? And like, did you see how they like did all these different um, like burner accounts and all posted this shit and built this crazy fucking narrative up about the the release and got people thinking there was actually like these kids looting a mall with motorcycles is all part of this release and like do one of the most difficult things possible which is go from having a mega viral moment with spit in my face and then successfully having it following that up with a second one like having a reel it in moment mm. you know like but then do but doing the the the, the thing amina was able to do but doing that which is crazy it's so difficult to catch two like certified hits yep. like mm-hmm. hits like reel it in is a hit you know it's probably i would say even maybe maybe more bigger at this point than like caroline you know um as far as just like how much i hear it at parties and shit still but anyway, the point point <laughs> aside right i love both the, i love i love both, i love amina's music a lot um but uh yeah i don't know i, I forgot what i was talking about the system no, he doesn't have a system. Oh, yeah, no, no system, no but, system. Well, I mean, well, let's get into this. So you came into the industry in many ways organically, right? But then like, I remember when, especially you mentioned that, um, when everybody was trying to like uh, sign Tom, mm-hmm. all right? Meetings, 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 meetings. Can you talk about what that experience is from a standpoint if I'm an artist, because there's so many people who get ripped, whipped in, up into that situation, but they don't have a you yet, right? So how did you determine who we don't go with, who we do go with, and just what did you learn in general from that process? Yeah, so I would say the first thing is I was so excited, and I was so happy to be there. And that's one of the, and like I said, I was really genuinely trying to make connections with people. And um, so if some, if an A&R reached out, like, um, I mean, I, I, like one of my one of my best friends in the sort of music industry is this dude named Pergo, um, and uh, it's funny because we met over like a producer dispute. Like he managed um, a producer who um, had produced a, a song for Chase, and the, the there was um, back accounting that needed to be done, and like you know we were just like, yeah, let's figure it out, whatever. But then our lawyers started kind of going out, especially like our lawyer at the time just kind of went a bit OD on it and sort of got it like hostile. So I'm like texting Pergo like, yo bro, like <laughs> it's not me. Like we're, we're just trying to get it done. Like whatever y'all want. We're totally cool. Cause even Chase had been like, I had been like, yo, like let's start here. And then like they can negotiate up from there. But he was like, now nah, let's just give him like a really fair amount, like out the gate. Like I fuck with him. Like it's cool. You know what I mean? Um, so it was super easy. But then yeah, after, um, after that whole thing, we just like became homies. But I think like really genuinely being stoked to meet people is, is the first key. Like, so even, cause you're not going to sign to, obviously you're only, even if you do sign, you're only going to sign with one person or one entity. So you're going to meet 12. It like make those other 11 meetings super valuable for your future. And like, just, and, and let you have that experience and, and, and chill with those people. Um, and the other thing is that most people, unfortunately are not empowered to do signings. So most of the a that reach out to you, especially from a major label system, are going to be really genuine, really stoked, super excited about the project, but they're not super, they don't have the ability to say, okay, cool, we're going to sign you mm-hmm. and we're going to do it tomorrow and this is the type of money. Because almost all the a especially the ones that were reaching out about Tom that I'm not friends with, I mean, they all like they know what's up. Like they're very smart. They're very savvy with the industry. Like they're very, they know where the, how things are going. And so um, it's not necessarily them that's preventing us from doing a deal with them. It's it's uh, the way the, the major labels are structured. So I'd say, especially if you're an artist on the good music, but not a lot of traction side yet, more on that sort of side, um, I would say, you know, just be ready for the fact that a lot of these meetings are just going to be like, um, you're getting to know people. And you're getting into that side of things. And then when there is a little bit more of a, a whirlwind, um, it, it's almost still the same. There's still going to be a lot of people who really want, they really believe in your music. They really want to help. And they want you to be something they really were able to do at the label. Um, but they're not all going to be empowered to just act upon it. Um, and then also people are going to rush you and you're going to feel rushed. And there's some truth in that, right? Like you do want to take advantage of that. Like, especially if you're in a real rush and you have people who are throwing like sort of like, if you're talking about like a really one, like life changing type of viral moment, 
you got people who are throwing you way too much money. And sometimes it's good to just take it because it's not smart. They're not thinking like business wise. They're thinking like competition wise. Mm. So you need to take advantage of that while there's all this hype. What do you mean competition wise? Like, you know, Warner is going to want to get as much market share as possible compared to Sony. And every per, every, um, every label, every, um, everyone who's on the business side for the most part, like, of course they want to be successful. And so, you know, it's really in the best interest of organizations with a lot of money that can take a lot of big risks to try to sign as much stuff as possible. Um, and so that's where it becomes valuable because not only is there, cause they're not necessarily putting a whole lot of risk on like losing a bunch of money. If the, the song doesn't finish streaming well or the, uh, and the future stuff doesn't stream well because they're, they're able to use that incidence to also play this sport that we're all playing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, if that makes sense. So they're more, they're more invested in, the loss that would come if they didn't make the artist get the arts versus the loss that could come from just throwing them a bag. That's what they're not really worth is what you're saying. Yeah. Like it's, there's, there's a multitude of factors behind why like bidding wars happen and, and how, why they end up, how they end up because it's kind of, I mean, it's also kind of like the NBA draft, right? It's like statistically, I don't think, I think obviously the higher draft picks across the board are going to be the more successful players like in on an average bell curve, but you also don't see a whole lot of number one draft picks who are in the Michael Jordan conversation. Mm -hmm. You see high, I mean, obviously it's like, you know, Kobe was 18, which is low, it's low for Kobe, but it's still high as fuck. Like that's a high pick, you know? And I think it's kind of the same thing where like, you know, every team, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, like they, they need to also keep their fans happy and stuff. It, there's a lot of things, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of concepts that go into why like the magic are tanking to get Markel Fultz a few years ago. Right. Um, and it's not just um, as simple as like one, one thing or another. Um, like it's not just, basically it's not just for the success of the team. There's other factors that go into it. Like on the, there's the winning record side of success, but then there's the fans being excited about the new side of things success. There's the mm-hmm. showing the person who owns the team that you're doing stuff as a general manager. Like there's all these different factors. And then of yeah. course there's the fundamental desire to build a great team. Mm-hmm. But you know, like, I mean like Greg Odin was, wasn't he number one? Yeah, he was. Yeah. And I mean, people shit on him. I think that's not fair, but I think he was someone who just, uh, isn't going to be Kobe Bryant or Shaquille O'Neal. And he gets picked really high because of this hype thing. So it didn't necessarily make sense to pick Greg Oden number one overall. Like in retrospect, obviously not, but there was like a, a moment around why people felt they needed to get that pick. And that's kind of the equivalent of that viral moment, right? That was that hype Mm -hmm. because no other time, especially after that period would Greg Oden be able to capture the same. Greg Oden bag. going and playing in Spain for three years does not wind up with him number one overall, most likely. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, unless, you know, like he goes and like progresses no. his game. And yeah. But based on how things went, yeah. you know, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Let me take a quick second to tell you about Forever Fan because many of you know that my agency is responsible for helping multiple artists blow up tens of billions of views and billions of streams. But I want to specifically talk about a strategy that we've used to help artists get millions of streams on their very first song. And as a matter of fact, in the last 12 months, an artist got signed to a major label using this specific strategy and you'll never guess what it is. Pre-saves. Yeah, that's right. Pre-saves. They're extremely powerful when you do them correctly, but most people don't understand how to do it. See, the problem becomes when you put all this effort for this pre-save campaign and then the song finally comes out. And then what happens after that? Nothing. You're starting from ground zero again because you're not about to ask people to pre-save every single time you drop a song. So I'm here to put you on to our solution for that, which is Forever Fan, a platform that removes this massive pain for artists by making it so when a fan pre-saves one of your songs, they automatically pre-save every single song that you drop after that. So your work doesn't just create a one-time fan of a single song, it creates a Forever Fan. And you can take advantage of this same solution. Go to foreverfanmusic.com so that you can get more streams and a deeper relationship with your fans for the same amount of effort. Foreverfanmusic.com. Check it out now. I know one big thing, obviously, that managers are always weighing and even artists are always trying to weigh or get is money. How do you look at money like in terms of running the organization? And also 
than building around the artist particularly because there's two those are two mm. completely different things and i think it, it didn't really click to me until we had clients that had really big artists mm. but they also had smaller artists and then you have to really realize it's like yeah i might be managing these two artists but that's a different business like i oh, can't yeah. take that artist's money and put it in this artist's yeah. budget you know what i mean so like how do you Again, just the, the business as a whole and then managing the artists. Yeah, so I think, I mean, like money is obviously the most difficult thing in, in our society, right? Like in every single way. And the way I look at money from a fundamental standpoint is that it represents freedom. Like it represents agency. Yeah. You know, if you have, it's the way our society operates, whether it's good or bad. But the more money you have, the more able you are to do things. And so it's, um, it's really, really important to use money to build a future for what we're working on now. And so my priorities with um, business side, like don't like try to work on the business, not in the business as much as possible. You know, is this the thing I go by? By the way, side note. Um, sorry, is in my head. Um, but on the business side, like my primary goal isn't like I'm not even gonna say what it isn't, but I'll say what it is. It's to be able to pay salaries to the people who work with me right now to pay significant enough salaries that I can be competitive. And it's also the, I mean, like there's a couple of homies who, if I got, you know, if we had the bread coming in to be able to pay people outside the core group and hire someone else, like I would, I mean, I would offer them a hundred thousand dollars tomorrow, 150, just because I know what they're capable of. And like they work in, the, and I want to outbid other organizations in music to be able to say, look, like build this over here and, but have the ability to really like um, make that happen. So, First and foremost is having the team and keeping the team so we can continue to build and continue to grow. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's, the, that's my main concern with the money on the business side is building a, a thing that's going to be here in 10 years. And that not only is going to be here in 10 years, but isn't going to be me in a garage selling vinyls out the back. It's going to be um, Remus, you know, like it's going to be something really significant. Um, and then on the artist side, it's the same philosophy. You know, I think what what we're really looking at as being extremely important in the industry today is that artists are being able to build businesses, right? And we're here to help that and we're going to make it fun. And it's like it is supposed to be in the music industry. There's some glamour to that, but it's still a business and we're going to help you build that. And so on any good business, you don't just throw money at shit that you don't need. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't necessarily... Like if you're opening up, I always use a donut shop as a metaphor because it's a very like, it's something you can make and sell. And people don't think of music in those terms enough. They think of it as very ambiguous and there's not a big connection to making music and getting money. So it seems to just sort of magically happen in some ways, you know? And so if you have, but if you have a donut, you give me $10 and I, you know, give you uh, three donuts then I just made $4 or whatever it is, right? Um, against the cost of the donuts. <clears throat> and so, um, when I'm looking at artist expenditure, it's like, what can we do to keep costs down overall and get you making money as quickly as possible? So we're not saying, hey, look, we're going to give you a hundred thousand dollar cash advance to open your donut store, you know, mm -hmm. because that's not the most efficient thing. You know, the most efficient thing is to really focus on what do we need now? What can we do? What do we What tools do we need on our side to um, help you execute creatively and for us to be able to do something on the paid side? on the marketing side and on the event activation side and things like that. But what's the minimum amount we can do to achieve those goals so that instead of having to stand behind a $10,000 marketing budget before we start making money back, let's stand behind a $5,000 one before we start making money back. And we can probably reasonably get similar good results. And then of course we have systems where based on our investor model and stuff, we're able to, we have access to pretty much like, any amount of money for like within you know normal bounds um so long as it makes sense for the investor so it's like even if we do work with an artist on a very small budget if that song goes stupid overnight and it's doing two hundred thousand streams a day we can go get two hundred thousand streams a day worth of advance to market that you know what i mean so there's not much of a, a limit on it but yeah in both cases it's what can we do to keep the team together to keep the business growing you know, that's the main first and foremost concern. Yeah. So what, what does that process look like? Like you have the acts, right. And you know, to your point, there are so many different ways that artists can make money or start to structure their business. So like, what does the process look like in terms of figuring out like the first two, three steps for an artist you, you start working with? Um, it looks at what their strengths are, 
you know, and I think it's always good to double down on strengths. And then it looks at like, what are ways that we can um, globalize and integrate this process within your world? You know, so basically like your streaming, your Instagram presence, your TikTok presence, your website, all those things should unify towards the goals that we have, whether it's like um, selling merch or releasing a project or whatever, um, you know, and that's difficult. Like it's difficult to do the, the sales and things side of things. And it's also difficult to grow that, you know, it's not like some magic silver bullet. Oh, you start doing merch, you'll make a lot of money. It's like, no, it'd be a lot of work and we might like make $400, you know, but it, it's all about, um, the growth process. And so as fresh, oh, it's a blessing, but it's also very unstable. But right now streaming is like the main way that, you know, we hope to be able to make initial money, especially in the investment front back. And that's scary because streaming is like you're going through third parties, your fan bases are on third parties. Mm -hmm. You don't have control or access of those data, those data points. Um, you know, you're pretty much left out to dry if anything should happen to one of those platforms. So that's why it's really important to us to find ways. And this is something I'm still really journeying through and working on wrapping my fucking head around is how do we really build off platform community where people are engaging with an artist's website and their discord. And we're spread out across so many things um, that first of all, we're spread out across third parties like discord and Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and Twitter and stuff. So that when like Twitter goes belly up, um, you know, we're prepared to take that hit. Um, but then, and it is, so it's diversification, but then there's really moving over to like the website and that's hard. It's hard to do that. Um, and it's something we're still working on, but I, I really think that if artists are going to have true creative freedom and like we as a infrastructure that's not run by BlackRock investments and stuff like that, like this whole, this side of the industry, basically like, um, if we're going to, going to succeed we have to have truly independent ways of capitalizing on the ip that we own right if we're going to say hey look our our side of the industry is going to own these masters and, and this side of thing like the creators are going to own this stuff then we we have to use that we can't just sit sit because the reason why like warner and shit is able to get away with having so much inefficiency with their booking and just like like accounting and stuff and like there's all the like there's there's just such a um like you know, like people aren't getting paid on time. It's like super common, right? But yep. it's because there's just so much money that it doesn't matter. So if you look at that model and you say, okay, cool, all we have to do is sort of like release music and be an artist and then streams will happen and we'll make money. Like that doesn't work on a small independent level and it doesn't even work as much on an independent, like um, like an artist level, like it, uh, not even independent from a label, but just like one individual artist. Like even like someone like Drake can probably always find ways to, make his process better and still see a big return on that. But like uh, Warner Music, I mean, they make like $4 billion in profit a quarter or something. I mean, you know, they have no, um, no way to do it. So it, it's just taking that, looking at what their example is, is not conducive, I think, to success as a particular artist or as a smaller team. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the investors earlier. Um, what did you learn when you went through that investment process? Because I know you've talked about how catalog is really huge these days, right? Like just as being a label looking for investors or for whether it's for an artist or your, your company, what do you feel like investors are? How are they analyzing things when they look at you? It's, it's a process, right? Like first and foremost, the thing that I've learned the most is that you should never be reliant on getting an investor as step one of your business build because you might not get it. Yeah. Um, and also a lot of it's going to come with stipulations that you're not going to be cool with. And so that's something I learned um, last year was just like, we I really was trying to get distribution money to start the label. And I was trying to get some sort of a, I mean, I wasn't asking for, this might sound crazy to some people, but like you all know how the industry is. Like I wasn't asking for much. I was asking for a hundred thousand dollars a year over three years, just super um, entirely marketing funds. And like, I even was asking for like, you all can mutually approve anything over 5k. You know what I mean? Yeah. Super low, low yeah, stake yeah. stuff. Right. I just wasn't able to get that. Um, uh, you know, and, and there was some learning, like so one, one distributor had reached out and I, there had some really cool dudes over there, but like I was super hell bent on getting overhead. That's another thing. 
Um, overheads, most people aren't going to go for that. To keep the team together, right? Yeah, but yeah. it's not realistic. So yep. what I looked at, what I realized is that was such a blessing to go through that experience, spend a lot of time trying to really, I took like 16 meetings, you know, with different distributors, different labels, things like that. Um, no one was really fucking with it. And so, well, the problem was they were fucking with it. Yeah. But then they were, it would, every conver- I got so mad, bro. Every conversation, was, I actually did kind of, mildly get like visibly irritated to someone at one of these zooms at this point but like um you know it, it's like every single conversation oh the, you're, you guys are developing artists amazing we need that that was needed more than ever in our industry like what do you need oh the center okay cool let me put you on with so-and-so boom oh um what's your catalog stream oh well we were management so we don't like really own anything and then we don't do a shitload of streams every day and we're only getting 15 percent of that but we have this team that we've built. We have these things. We've done this. We've got this expertise and blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Well, you know, hit us back when, when you're streaming. And then I'm like, why the fuck? By the time we're streaming, would I be hitting you back for money? If we have enough money that you're going to give me like, at this point. And so that was such a, such a conversation. It was always this interest um, followed by disinterest. And once again, I think it goes back to like people who are um, lower on the totem pole and working up. Like those people are, are younger typically or they're fresher in the industry and they just understand. So they're like, yo, this is great. And then you get to the person at the top and they just um, aren't, uh, aren't fucking with it. They don't care as much. Um, That's exactly how I thought about that. Like the A, even on the investment side, it's like A and R's, right? And then you, <laughs> and the people get it. Or a regular job, you talk to the recruiter, oh my gosh, you're so amazing. Then they got to talk to the hiring manager and nothing happens, right? So, and it's a, it's a really common thing. There's been very, very few situations where it's been like the opposite. You get the person who is big money and they sign and close things and they're like, oh, I love you. So then you can kind of try to supersede past that mm-hmm. other person who doesn't love you or whatever, but they're lower on the totem pole. But it's, um, I think, but it's cool because at least you you know that you need both of those tiers, right? It's like the, you're going, the emotional connection essentially is usually that first line, the A and R type person, mm-hmm. right? Because because also you do want those people there who actually do care about you. Well, those are the most important people because exactly. I'm saying like they're they're, there, they're right? they get severed. The connection gets severed between them and the upstairs people because most mm-hmm. the emotional the people not emotional but the people who understand it they don't even have clout enough to really convince someone to make sure they sign it, and it's like. Mm-hmm. Um, they have to rely on that person's decision. And so what, what happened is I learned that. And the beauty of that lesson was it's kind of scary to think about, oh shit, we've done all this stuff. We've learned all these things. And now we have to also learn how to build a business that makes money. We, I was hoping to just sort of do the m- magical music thing and you, you, you go <laughs> sign some artists and you get the, the distribution deal. And then somehow you live in a house in the Pacific Palisades. Um, but, but, um, no, that's not how it is. You got to fucking get scary. You gotta, you gotta go down and buckle down and face some fears and realize you're not going to be making money for longer than you thought you weren't going to be making money. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so really pursued that built a really good distribution partnership with STEM, um, which is awesome. Non-exclusive, you know, we do everything, um, on this basis where we have total, total freedom. Uh, and total control, which is really important. Um, and then we have been working closely. We started out with um, 1960 Management, did one uh, record with them that went really well. It was awesome. Um, did Star Killer by Curtis Waters. And then um, we got a, uh, we started working with Indify. And that's been really awesome. Jordan over there, I talked to like literally almost every day. Um, and they're, they've been so supportive and helpful and, and with them we've signed a couple of people and then I've just been talking to um, someone else that I'm stoked to be working with. Um, but I think what was key is like, we came correct, you know, like we really had these expectations of look, all we need is this amount of money for this single or for this EP and we can prove something, you know? And, and frankly, actually the first person we signed um, this year was even before anyone that came through on the Indify side with an investment. I just came out of pocket because I found the songs. Amina Sanad, um, she's super sick, um, like singer songwriter that I really fuck with. We all like, she's super dope. Um, but I found this song, Turn the Record Over on TikTok. And I was like, yeah, this is great. Um, and so I reached out and like, I, you know, we weren't super, super locked in on having like a flow on the investment side yet. And so, um, 
yeah, I was like, yo, this is great. And like, but I made that move, you know? And so it, it's like that ability to be, um, uh, just building slowly is, is the biggest thing. So when you're looking for investment and stuff, I would say, don't worry about it. It's going to be way longer and way harder to get. And then when you do get it, it, it even so it's never a, a bailout. Like it, it's never like, okay, cool. I have investors who fuck with me now. Therefore, you know, I'm making more money. I have enough money to pay the team. It's not like, now we have more work and it's great. Um, be accountable too. But we have people to be accountable. And, and <laughs> yeah, and, and, but also it's like because we have marketing funds and we have money for artists now, which is dope. Yeah. But it doesn't really affect us. And then like we're still in this phase of like not getting a whole lot of streaming royalties coming through because of the recoupments on the investment and just like the fact that we're starting and building artists from, from relatively smaller levels in a lot of cases, you know, which is super awesome and rewarding. Yeah. But it's a... Yeah, it's a process. And so even just staying on the investment conversation and recruitment, like you, you gave me a, a really p interesting piece of advice the other day that I think would be good, kind of iterated here, right? You talked to me about the, I don't, know, I don't, I'll let you word it better, but it was basically along the lines of like, you know, you you don't need to shoot for the big bag, go for the smaller bag to prove to the investor that you're worth investing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? In the mm -hmm. conversation we're talking about. Yeah. Can you can you talk about that more and kind of break down your thinking your thinking with that? Yeah. So just like with anything else, you know, you're looking long term. You always have to be thinking about what do I do to do a good job now that's going to stack up. And if I do a good job on all these little things now, then in a year I'll be set up well. And so, you know, say, for example, you have someone who's let's just say like, I guess you're in my shoes, right? Which is a bit more rare. Like I know there's probably a lot more artists who watch this and it's not like a lot of aspiring You'll you be know. surprised, man. <laughs> Don't shit on our audience, man. I'm not shitting man, on your you audience. Know all out there. I'm not shitting you know on your audience. <laughs> I like artists. But I mean, like, I have a very specific niche of existence. Like, I'm like a, a struggling indie label owner. Like, it's <laughs> like, okay, it's like I'm from, I'm from like a, like I'm, I'm a character in Scott Pilgrim. Like, um, but, uh, <laughs> oh, shit. Um, but yeah, so it, it's, it's basically, you want to work those relationships in a way that makes sense and, and gives them the longest life because the real life things don't work out the first time for the most part mm -hmm. or the second time or the third time, even sometimes, especially not in the way that you really want them to, like they might scrape by, but most of the time it's not like, Oh, this is the first thing that we tried. Cool. Our dreams came true, you know? And so when I'm looking at working with an investor, it's not like, oh shit, okay, we have this one chance to like blow this one artist out of the water and super impress them because I know that's not super likely. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, what can we do to really show good faith and build a great relationship where they trust us and they trust what we're doing and we're able to show that we're making them money back. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, well, dude, you know, you have to be ready for the fact that we might not recoup of the first couple things. So you don't, you want to never be in a position where you look stupid because you came in and they were like, Hey, yeah, we can do $10,000 for this artist. And you're like, okay, sick. $10,000 for this artist. Like, awesome. Let's put it all with this one person. And it, I know it doesn't make sense, you know, but let, let's say $10,000 is not that much. Let's say it's 20,000, right? $20,000. And you know, for a fact, this person needs like max of seven and a half or 10 K, especially for the, what you're doing in that moment, right? If you go and take that extra money and it flops, then you're in a position where you've demonstrated that you don't have a good handle of how much money you need to do this. You've demonstrated that you're not necessarily, um, reliable in that regard. And you've also shown that you're like taking bigger risks than are necessary. Because, but if you can come in there and say, look, you know, Oh, here's 20k. Cool. Well, we really only need, um, in my opinion, like 6,500. But it's really good to know that um, if the artist comes back and they really want to have some more money for whatever reason, then we have the ability to make that call on whether or not to take this risk on this thing, you know, because, you know, the lifeblood of what we do is um, third party investment. And so if we don't have that, then it's really difficult for us to make good um, good avenues to, to signing artists, especially artists who already have some traction going. Mm. And so it's really, really, really important to always be doing a great job for um, the investor as well. But the thing is, it all plays back into success because the artist doesn't lose out because, like I said, you went and thought, what's the minimum efficient 
a way that we can maximize this stuff because then they're making money back faster mm -hmm. and you're money, making money back faster and the investor's happy. And so then they want to put more money into the artist's next project. So it's all like an abundance mentality and it all works. If you hold yourself accountable to the people who are doing right by you, then everything comes together and works out. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, it's a uh, super, super important to just be like really cognizant of the fact that someone offering you X amount of dollars is not like life changing until it's life changing money in your bank account. Yeah. That's yours. You know, yeah. the beautiful thing about that is like, I think when you say abundance mentality, a lot of times people just think big numbers, but really that's abundant and really thinking about the long term. And there's going to be more money, more money that comes that this money. All right. But most people just focus on what this money is and how big mm -hmm. that number is. And like it forces you to have a this is going to be it mentality, which warps how you think about it when on a investor end, especially the more seasoned investors, like they have some very reasonable expectations. Like they don't think a lot of times the money is going to come back just off of this song mm -hmm. like within a month or something like that. Um, but we're in this space that's unique because we have access to capital and in more abundance at smaller levels, like more micro loans. Like, uh, like it's, it, w it wouldn't have been easy to get a whole bunch of 5K, 10K type of investments back in like 2005 or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, it'll be more of that, oh, yeah, I don't invest in anything less than 100K, 250K. But so I think what now what we're encountering is this era where a lot of artists and their teams, they're being forced to have to learn this type of process because typically if, by the time you start getting to those other numbers, unless it's like a viral moment, you're a little bit more seasoned anyway. And you're thinking about it more logically because even what you said, uh, it reminded me of... Um, Shout out to Sir, Sir Love. It reminded me of two things. But Sir Love was one of the first people who was like really music industry through and through into it in terms of like how he thought and saw the business. He really knew it in and out from a technical standpoint. And when he was building out like campaigns for artists, he had this process where he was always like, we'll do a show at this cap. And I think let's just pretend you're a venue owner and you own three different venues. I'm gonna go for your smaller venue mm. and then build your trust there. Try to you know sell that out, and then that's a really good. Him, that's a great metaphor right? for it. Yeah. Exactly, it's the same thing. So it's like let's just get the now with that we have trust because that's really what it comes down to. It's always better trust. to sell out the 200 cap room than to have 400 people in the thousand cap room. Exactly, 100. Mm. percent But we, you know, we're impatient ourselves. I know, I, you know, we all kind of want to hit that number. Like, it's not hit. like that's the thing too. Is like, you know, I'm not like removed from the giant hustle mentality of the creativity. You know, it's like, that's one of the things I think people think that like, um, you know, like there's a, a sort of sometimes it seems like, oh, there's like these ARs and stuff who are just sitting there and the artists are like really create, like struggling and creating this world and building it up brick by brick. And it's like, that's something that I'm really passionate about doing is just like working on this shit and like making it, mm. making it great, you know? And so like that, that mentality of, uh, I'm sorry, I actually lost my train of thought. I've been struggling to catch it for like the last like six words. <laughs> so I said mentality. I was like, I'm giving up the ghost. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll just add this then. Um, like what you're, you did, went through last year, of course you, you not only learn, but it's great because of the way you move, you already built relationships and you have these initial investors that can keep up with you. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the first touch point, when you're like you're, you're coming in to get money <laughs> on their end, they're coming in to get to know you, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and a lot of times, more often than not, you're not going to get that money, but over time, if you continue to prove out, they see you watch, they, they see you move, you continue to grow, you know, eventually you'll be able to like, turn the faucet on this investor, this tech guy, um, basically when we took me through this process, he was like, yo man, when you try to get money, it should be easy. 
that was a crazy part. He like threw my mind off because I was it was pretty early twenties at the time. And he was just like, yeah, it should be easy because you should be building re- these relationships beforehand. You never want to build the relationships when you need the money and like the business is going to go down or or all of a sudden it just something major is going to happen. Mm-hmm. You should already have the relationships. And he took me through a really technical process where you'll reach out to people and kind of let them know you're interested, in not at but in what you're trying to raise. But you'll send like weekly updates. But this is on like. A regular business. Well, that, right? that's something that I think is cool to talk about too. Is like, you know, how do you reach out to people in music if you're trying to get into it? And yeah. the, the answer is, you always you should bother them because I, dude, I have like literally 467 unread text messages notification on my phone right now, and I'm not in like group chats that I don't answer. I'm only in two, so it's like it's like at least 200 people I just haven't fucking replied to, you know? And it's like, it's just, it's not because I'm ignoring anybody. It's just because like I get so busy and those days I might get, I might talk to you saying bother them. Like, Make sure they're aware, or like, like, <laughs> I really bother yes. them. Yeah, no, like, bro, text, text, text me every three days, you know what I'm saying? Because, because otherwise, I'm not gonna see it. And the first four times, I'm not gonna care. And it's like, um, uh, the best way to do that is to just show progress, like, don't just be like, hey, what's up? Would love to still get on this call. Yep, instead of that, say, hey, what's up? I just did this photo shoot with my friend who's an artist, check it out. Um, Hey, what's up? I just, um, you know, my artist friend just released this. So I put together a show for him, whatever. And then by the second or third one, I'm like, Oh shit, this person gives a fuck. Cool. And my thing is, I think anyone for the most part can be, can learn to do anything as long as they want to. And like, there's nothing that I do that I don't think someone couldn't be become capable of doing in the high level that we need in like six months. And so dude, I would like, it doesn't matter about experience or whatever. It's just like, do you give a fuck? And are you doing things on your own that are showing that you're like, have you're in that same hustle mentality? Yep. I mean like, dude, every, like cam and Augusto, like Augusto is man. Like don't be greedy as managing femmes tour in, uh, for Avril Lavigne, right? Uh, opening for Avril Lavigne right now in Europe, like 30 dates. And don't be greedy is your company just to remind Yes. Don't be greedy is the company. <laughs> yeah, I got that shit yatted. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, we're doing that. And, and dude, Augusto managed his first tour. Like, uh, I think last year he, he managed Tom's tour. Right. Mm-hmm. And that was because I just said, yo, you, you know, I need like tour manager. And like, obviously I met reference. We, we did blue summer together. Um, and he was just like on some Batman shit. Like I knew this day would come. Um, <laughs> but I was like, yo, yeah, like let's do it. And so then it's like, cool. Like you're going to manage Tom's tour. And like, I just, threw him into that i mean like within like um a month or something he's like he's advancing the entire tour mm-hmm. and it's like the very first thing is okay cool yo our agent at arrival jeremy yeah this is a gusto like mm-hmm. talk to him about a lot of this stuff keep him in the loop and it's like but you put people in that and i know like i believe in him i know he's smart enough to do that i know he's got the background i know he gives a fuck then he does it or like cam who runs our marketing like um he just always wanted to be involved because he's like um, been trying to work in music for a while and obviously he's he's Cam's uh, he's Taj's best friend and so that. yeah, yeah that's how like yeah Cam and Taj went yeah, to I don't know how he came around I didn't know that yeah, yeah, yeah. they played basketball together I yeah I you gotta him, get hip to the lore <laughs> he, he explained you gotta get you gotta get hip to the lore man you gotta understand like, what's going you know that bro you gotta <laughs> I know I met Cam in person like one time and he's like <laughs> yeah he's six seven um but but yeah, I mean, he just wanted to be involved. And then it was like, cool, we need someone to do marketing. It's like, yo, Cam, do you think you can do this? And like, you know, ground zero for nothing from scratch. Got in there. And y'all helped, obviously. Ja'Cory, you went through and like showed him like the ropes and stuff. But like, and now we're running campaigns. I mean, we've run consultation campaign for Suki Waterhouse. We were doing one with Rebounder right now. We're doing like marketing consultation campaigns. And we're running all the Tom stuff, the Taj stuff, the Chase stuff, mm-hmm. and all the record stuff as well. And it's going really well. And it's like, um, he didn't have experience in that, you know, it's just like, yo, all right, cool. You've got like, bro, the first campaign he did, we spent $14,000. Yeah. It was on fuck with me too. And that song now it does about 10 to 12, uh, across Apple and everything probably does about 14,000 streams a day, you know? And I attribute most of that to that campaign we did. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that was Cam's first experience. Like, Hey, like essentially, um, you know, obviously I was like heavily involved and I did a lot of the outreach and things like that, but it was pretty much like what I told him was basically, yeah, you're, here's $15,000, you 
figure out how to spend it. And of course, like, you know, there's like a middle ground. Like, he didn't just like Superman up and just do it perfectly out the gate. But it, like, I, like I said, I did do a lot of it, but it was still like, just <laughs> cool. You did that. Now you're officially more experienced than like Not most marketing. People. <laughs> people. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that's been huge. And so I say that to say like, it's really important to, and like the way I met Nick who runs um, our A and R um, and same thing with him. He was just like, yo, I want to be an a and It's like, cool, okay, on CC is the head of A&R, don't be greedy. You know, and Nick's been almost two years now, I think. But he, bro, Nick, um, Nick hit me um, like four or five times in the DM, and then I gave him my number, and then he texted me like four or five times. And then literally the time that I hit him back, I was like, fuck, I feel bad that I haven't hit this dude back. He keeps hitting me up. But he hit me up in the right way. He'd always be like, yo, I'm doing this photo shoot, or yo, um, check this shit out or whatever. Constantly. It's just like, yo, or, or, or even if it's just like, yo, I saw Tom has another show. Even if it's like double texting from the last show, still, like, oh, I saw Tom has the other thing coming up. Can I shoot this one? You know what I mean? It's just like being super on it. And I was like in line at public, so like getting a sub and I was like, fuck. And then I like called him. I was like, yo, you're on. And I called him. But, um, and yeah, no, he, we've been working together for like two years. Um, but that was so sick. And like, that's what I would say. It's like, like be 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 like Nick. <laughs> be like Nick. <laughs> be like Nick. Well, you you gotta be in this industry, I think, which is weird because people it's so unorganized, it's chaotic. And as somebody who initially started like not being in music at all, and then transitioning, and just seeing like how different professional worlds exist, and so you would try to organize as much as possible, but it's just the nature of being in a creative industry. Yeah, and it's also, like, there's only so much you can organize without fucking exploding. Yeah. Like, my brain, uh, in some cases, I do operate much more abstractly, and mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a struggle to take things out of my mind and put them on paper. Um, but I do also like the security that comes with that, so that's why we have a big emphasis on systems at the company. Um, but it's so difficult. It's so difficult because you can't organize everything because we're in such a fluid industry. So you can't say, oh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., I work on this because every day this is different. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can't say, oh, you know, cool, I'll send my emails today and then it'll be done. Like I always have these 10 emails. Because every time you send an email, it creates this like um, fractal of possibilities that you then have to Show deal with. Responses and possibilities. <laughs> yeah. I almost don't even want to send it. Like, <laughs> yeah. And that's every single email, every single call, every single interaction. And they all take some part of your energy throughout the day mm -hmm. especially if you're stoked about stuff a lot which like i usually get pretty stoked when i take calls and meetings so i'm usually just stoked to talk to whoever it is and so that'll like drain my ability to do other work because i've just spent like especially if like back to backs it'll be like three hours of just like being stoked and then i'm like fuck i need to like go outside and like eat something or smoke a blunt or whatever um but i uh yeah so organization is super important, but super difficult to nail down, mm -hmm. I would say. No, we touched on touring a little bit, but like getting deeper into it. So we know budgets are a real thing. Mm -hmm. Setting up your first tour in general is just the logistics. It's a new process. How'd y'all go about setting up the first tour? And, you know, what are some of the, the ways you got around things in a way that'll help artists who are trying to learn that? I was really, really, really lucky because one of my good friends is a dude named Jake Short, and he is the tour manager for Snot, and I think Eam Triplin now, and like their whole camp is just crushing it. Um, but he's super experienced, and I just reached out to him for like a couple times, like just breakdowns, like, yo, what the fuck do I do here? And just had him walk me through it. And then Jake took more time too, because when the first thing I said when I said, Augusto, you want to be tour manager or whatever, I was like, okay, cool, talk to Jake. Hmm. And like, he like just got literally Jake just like put him on game for an hour as well. And so having a Jake in your life is super helpful. Um, <laughs> uh, those who do not have a Jake or yeah. a Nick. Bro, I have like seven people named Jake in my phone. It's by far the most common name <laughs> in my phone. What do you, uh, what did Jake tell you though? Um, yeah. So I think a lot of it could be summarized in don't panic. You know what I mean? Mm. Just stay organized. Just be on top of every correspondence you know um and there's a lot of intangibles that you just can't like tell somebody because i was pretty like i would trust jacory with it too for example or you because we've run events and that's very similar running an event is very similar to running a tour and so i didn't really go from scratch nothing because it's it's like um it's not just that i started out on the merch table or i started out doing day-to-day -to -day tour stuff 
it's like I was like on top of an entire tour yeah. um, initially. And then um, we, uh, uh, like, yeah, I even like when we had, uh, we opened for Jack, or we co, well, no, yeah, we opened. We opened for Jack K's. Um, it was awesome. And uh, like, I put that together too. So it's like at the time I was also acting the part of the agent, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it was like a lot, but I can't, I don't know if there's anything very particular that I could say that, cause there's so many small things. There's so many things. I guess the biggest thing I would say is make sure you book everything ahead of time and over communicate. Like if you need information from somebody before something else can happen, hit them every single fucking day until you get it. You know what I mean? Also realize that like um, festivals and stuff won't start advancing until a month out. And most venues won't tell you they won't start advancing until a month out explicitly, but they really don't respond to you until it's like uh, pretty close to it. So there's only so much you can do. Um, so I'd maybe say, make sure you have your, your hotels and everything organized and then do advancing. Um, what's advancing just like getting all the information over to the venue and like, um, figuring out, okay, cool. Where's the load in? Where does the merch table go? Do you have our sound plot? Like our stage stage plot rather, you know, do you have all these elements that are, um, that they need to have ahead of time? Um, and then also it's sort of like advancing the whole tour, you know, like getting Airbnbs organized, getting uh, the rental car organized, figuring out who's getting paid, what figuring out like what the gas cost is going to be like, um, routing, like, like usually if you know, your agent will route it for you. If you don't have an agent, it's like, cool. What's the best, tr- like, how can we travel? You know, cause we had our first tour, we had to drive from fucking Chicago to San Francisco and we had two days <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Um, it was 19 hours the first day and 17 hours the second day of Crazy. driving. Crazy. Um, you know, obviously not repeating that, right? Um, so, yeah, but basically too much to, a lot of it just comes from, you just got to do it and just be, oh, you know what? Okay, here's a piece of advice. that This is what I did now that I think about it. Every single, I made it a habit with touring specifically with our first tour. Um, I, every single time anyone said anything in an email that I didn't understand, even if it was like an oblique reference to something, I would say, Oh, yo, really quick. What does that mean? And I had no, it, it can take a little bit of courage, I think, to do that because, you know, you want to feel like you have your shit going on. So people take you seriously. So you want them to perceive that, I guess, like socially, um, at least I do. And so having the just being made like literally making myself oh cool i don't know what she's referring to or or whatever here hey by the way what does this mean i'm not going to try to infer it based on context because i'm going to ask you specifically i did that so much in the beginning and that helped out immensely because it's really easy to sort of uh i don't know i don't want to ask i don't want to bother them and then you are on two different pages over time mm-hmm. on shit so that was that was the big one ask Every, even if it's like an email and you're like, yo, I have six questions. Like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what that is. I don't know what this is. I don't know how to do this. And I didn't even know we had to do that. Ask them all. You know what I'm saying? Like get information. That's the big, that's the big takeaway. How would y'all choose the cities? Uh, that was our agent. I mean, like it, it's, uh, there's A markets, B markets and C markets. A markets is like Los Angeles, New York City. I think a B market is probably like an Augusta. No, that'd be like a C market. Oh. Yeah. A B market might be like Orlando. I think I'm not sure. I don't, there's not like a, I'm not an agent, so I don't know exactly, but for like an example, like Tampa, Florida versus like New York city, like they're not the same type of market. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you start out in the A markets, which basically it goes by like a combination of overall population size is the, by far the biggest factor. And then secondarily, I would say it's kind of like culture, you know, like cultural relevancy and things like that. Um, and, and then you like, uh, hit those ones first because you have the most chances of people being there that fuck with you. So in most people in the U S like most of their fans are usually going to be in LA County, you know, or New York city or something like that. When they start getting some traction, like, um, if you're in a certain space, I guess, but you know what I'm saying? Like you have a higher chance of selling 200 tickets in a place with like 20 million people, as opposed to a place with like a hundred thousand people mm-hmm. type thing. So you start with a markets and then you do a and mostly a markets with some B markets peppered in there. And then when you really get to the point you're doing 30 or 40 city tours, you might be doing some stuff like, um, I don't even know if there's C markets. I might've made that up, but I think there is. Oh, because it's, the, it's the primary, secondary, tertiary markets. Like yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Primary, yeah. So, I don't know what a C market to me would look like. Like, 
no offense, but like, you know, like Mobile, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I'd really want to, um, I don't know, no hate to Mobile though, bro. I have a funny story about Mobile, but I won't say it because I'll piss off all the Mobile people <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> all the Alabama. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mobile is too close to that. All right, I mean, look, <laughs> you manage like different levels of artists. Corey was talking about that earlier in the, uh, well, before the pod. You know, Taj is in a different place, different type of create, uh, creative approach. You talked about very few songs over a long period of time. Tom's at a different place, all right? Chase was in a very different place. Like, what is it like when you managing that? Like, can you kind of even use the details of this artist moves this way and it causes me to have to move, do that, and this artist, I can't build you that same system, so it causes me to have to do that. Like, what does that look like? I think they're, it's all pretty similar. You know, I mean, that was one thing I do remember, like, um, early on like when i first started working with him chase was like yo just keep in mind like i'm gonna he said it pretty explicitly like just keep in mind like i'm at a different level you know than taj is or when when you know sean when we first started working together like he's at a much different level than sean was you know what i mean so it's like he wasn't saying it in like a you know um hot shit way but he was just saying like just remember like you can't like treat everything the same for me as it is with them because i had and that was something he would like was really just sort of gently getting into my head it's like yo like you know i was signed to benny blanco like i've been around like real shit you know like really high level shit at a time when i still hadn't you know Mm -hmm. so that was like really good advice um that i've i've always kept in mind but at the same time uh i think the most tangible way to say it is the way it operates is pretty egalitarian so it's like this has always been my policy because i've started out managing a few people And so it's like, if we get an opportunity because of Taj or we get an opportunity because of Tom, right? The first thing that happens is that opportunity with Tom gets completely handled for Tom, right? It's like, okay, cool. Like this brand reached out or this um, Spotify reached out or I got this new connection. I think a more more consistent realistic example is like I get a new connection at a DSP, right? Something like that. They're interested. They're excited about Tom, right? As it so often is the way that people come in the door. And it's like, cool here's all Tom's stuff. Let's work together. Here's what we're doing. Let's get the meeting set up with you guys, all this stuff. Let's get that handled. It's done. There's no possible way to fuck that up. And then it's like, cool. Hey, uh, by the way, this is my other artist, Taj Keaton. This is what he's got going on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Similarly, like, um, we got a euphoria placement a couple years ago for Taj and was able to make friends with, uh, Jen Maloney who's a really dope, um, music supervisor. She's like, apparently the goat now like she's doing so much fucking crazy shit so i'm just even stoked that we got to work with her for a little bit um but you know and so you know got that contact and was able to send her music and stuff and so it's like cool this is because of taj so yo here's all the taj stuff here's all this stuff here's what's going on okay cool blah blah blah. we're doing like that's accepted that's done it's in her mind in a place of importance and priority and it's there and then a week later, it's like, oh, and also here's some of the other artists I'm working with. Here's some other songs. You know what I mean? Here's Tom's stuff. But in that way, I think it's fair because that's the way that I'm able to build like the all ships rise type of thing without ever leveraging someone's uh, stuff in a way that like would, would get into the territory of potentially benefiting me more overall than them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So that's the first, that's what I would say very specifically is when you're working with artists, just for me it's worked first like like just go based off of who the reach out is from you know what i'm saying like just really go and make sure that gets handled first you know and it could be like there's times when it's like okay cool like this person reached out for something from tom and i can i know taj would just be a great fit or vice versa someone reached out for something about taj and i know tom would be a great fit but it's like it doesn't matter you know what i'm saying because they reached out to Taj, they shot two Tom. So that's yeah. who's getting handled with the whole thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if it like fizzles out because, you know, maybe it isn't a good fit and one of them doesn't want to do it, but the other one would have, it's still like, I'll let it fizzle. You know what I'm saying? Because it's not about like, oh, but oh, we got Tom or we got Taj. You know what I mean? It's like just letting them live their own lives in those spaces. It's really important because it is like it's separate they're separate people with separate brands and separate businesses and we have separate relationships mm-hmm. um, and all this stuff. And it's, it's like, there is a collective mentality around don't be greedy for sure. 
you know, and like, you know, Sean and Taj like work together all the time on shit and they, they're definitely respect the fuck out of each other's art. Um, but it's not like odd future, you know what I mean? And so it's like, you know, I spend a lot of my day doing Taj stuff and a lot of my day doing Tom stuff. And that's also part of the reason why don't be greedy records exists in the first place is because I wanted to create a vehicle to sort of help unify the team that we had on the management side to help unify what we're doing culturally, you know, and provide a bedrock for that beyond just, um, you know, these, uh, these three guys, you know what I mean? And so, and the, but the thing is that gives me like the better that the label does and the more we're able to impact culture and make a big difference for creatives and do awesome shit that we're stoked about, then I'm more empowered to create opportunities, whether it's salaries for like the people that I want to keep working with, or if it's upgraded connections as the artists that I'm working with, like Taj and Tom are growing, I'm more empowered to help Taj meet his moment when he does have something go viral. And then all these connections we've been building come out the fold. Like I'll be much more able to do that in a much more effective and meet the moment type of way. If I'm already Sam who owns don't be greedy, who everyone knows about because I'm doing great shit in the industry. And so then really big pieces of the puzzle are only a phone call away, mm. you know? And so it's like, it's basically a, almost like I would think of it almost as it, it's like, it, um, I don't know how to phrase it, but it, it's just what I do to be able to continue to do what I do. Like even the, like the artists that we're signing on record side are also fucking sick. And it's just, amazing to me that we're even getting time of day from these people, let alone they want to work with us, you know, and that wouldn't be there if we hadn't consistently just demonstrated like all this dope shit we're doing. So yeah, it's like, you, you got to just, um, build something that's going to support everything else, I guess. But, but, and there's the differences too. Like the management is different from the label, you know? And so the type of stuff that I do for Taj and Tom individually is different than the type of stuff that I personally will do for some of the, like for the record side. Right. Because there's like, um, you know, like this really, really deep relationship that we've built over like years and years and years of working together so closely. Yeah. Um, and so in order to be able to still work with and support amazing creatives and like be able to be part of this world that I love so much, you know, I can't go and manage like three other people or anyone because I'm not going to be the same manager as good as that manager personally, because what you're seeing with Taj is like, or with Tom, it's like, bro, that's like so much blood, sweat and tears. You know I mean? That's like real, like 3 a.m. phone call. Like, it's a lot of shit. And I just like, that's what makes it work so well. So I think makes me such a great manager, but like, um, you can't replicate that with a whole bunch of people. So it's like, how do we create something where, where I can truly do a great job with everybody that, that we want to work with, Yeah, you know? And then it's like, that's where the record side come in because then it's like, cool. Now I really have a team supporting me with these records things, especially because, you know, most people like, like Nick's goal is, is not to just work for someone's manager, like a manager who has some clouded artists down the line. Like, you know, if everyone blows up, it's not his goal, you know, I'm, I'm sure. And so it's like, what can I do to create an ecosystem that someone like Nick or like Cam or Augusto or Courtney or whomever is um, going to be empowered to grow within what, what I'm working on, you know? And so that, that gives a way for like, these are people that I think can really carry forward my vision in a really effective way. And of course I'm like, I me, mean, I'm so, I'm still incredibly involved with everything, but it's like this way I have this way to know, like, I'm not going to let anyone down that we're working with. You got this great team, you know? Yeah, and you said something interesting, right? You talk about wearing the, the two hats, the, the label owner hat and then the manager hat. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you see the, the difference in those roles? Because I think a, a lot of artists, at least ones I talk to, they tend to get the, the lines blurred, right, between, like, what managers do and, and what labels do. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like you've kind of drawn, like, a, a pretty clear line for that. So, like, what is the, like, one, like, how do you view those those roles, like, in, in, in the differences in terms of, like, what you have to do? And then I guess follow up question would be like, what is the difference between a manager and a really involved label head? Like, well, how do you view that difference? Yeah. So I would say, I would, I would say that like, 
you know, I don't think there's as clear of a line as I meant it to come off as it's like, there is like a difference, right? There's a difference. And the, the fact is, I don't think it's very possible as an individual to be a really good manager in the way that I'm a really good manager for a whole lot of people, you know, sometimes you just need, uh, just, personal relationships are. like you said you were friends with tom and todd before yeah it's a yeah. different it's been a different type of scenario for me um and so i think that basically i love management like i love doing that stuff i love being that involved um and so like the goal for what don't be greedy as a label does i like the term label almost like aesthetically like it sounds cool to me to say oh, i run a label but i i think more succinctly it's a creative services company you know and i think that what we've kind of done is realize like hey as management we really i, I released ronald pretty much me and julia maltz um uh, and foundation uh distributor but we pretty much released ronald like it was mostly me you know operating as don't be greedy and like courtney and nick um helped out quite a bit but most of the heavy lifting and everything was me um and so i was like shit like and then, you know, the deals we do with Tom, they're all distribution deals and the distributors are dope. We like working with them, but like we do most of the work by design, mm. you know, um, and we did everyone scared with Taj and I was just realizing like, yo, this management stuff is basically we're acting as a label. And so to me, what we do on the record side is we try to, we have the same approach as management. Like, you know, it might not be as deeply like personal with every single artist that we're signing for me as it would be with like Taj, which is just cause he's, you know, or Sean or whomever, like that's someone I've known for four years. But what it is, um, shit, what the fuck was I saying? It's like, we still want to really be there for people and really be part of their journey and really be part of their process and have fun and like be friends with them and have like a sort of family mentality around what don't be greedy is. And so I want to be able to give that to people that work with us and feel like when they work with us, it's pe like, we really want to be like homies. Like we want people to be able to have frank discussions and have conversations about things that aren't just music and really be friends with people and stuff like that. And I think it's like, you know, yeah, just, just creating that world. And I think part of it too, that's important to me is like, the label moniker gives artists a sense of flexibility, right? Because you could, if it doesn't work out with Don't Be Greedy, like you can just go to your next song or your next album with somebody else and that's totally fine, you know? But I think with management, it's a little bit more like you're really committing on a personal level to somebody. And so that can be a little bit overwhelming for an artist to make a decision on. It's like, oh, you know, do I want to like commit to you as a manager? Mm -hmm. And then this kind of gives people a way to build that relationship because ultimately I think there is going to be such a blurred line between management and label. You know, I mean, it already is like the way we work with the artists that we work with now on label side. I mean, dude, we do so much cool shit with them and most of it stuff like a label traditionally wouldn't be doing necessarily. Right. Um, it's just about having fun and like building, um, building a community. Dope. I think is important. Dope. Well, Hey man, Sam, appreciate you stopping by, man. It's always dope to talk to you and hopefully I feel like people should have a really holistic view of what that journey looks like for a manager to go go uh to go from ground up but also on the other side like what it looks like to work with a good manager right some of the thoughts and how they're thinking about things mm -hmm. as well so once again everybody y'all know what it is this is no labels necessary I'm Brandman Sean and I'm Corey and we out peace